Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the session on hands-on accessibility testing with Nick Stanhart. Um, this session is scheduled to go on until 3.20, but I know that Nick is actually uh, planning to carry on after that in the room next door, so uh, that's an option for you. Um, and my job is very easy because Nick's going to introduce himself. Thank you, Nick. Thanks. So welcome to accessibility testing. This is a bit of a weird setup, so I might have to swivel around. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Nick. I've been doing accessibility since the mid-1990s. I uh, have probably forgotten a whole lot about accessibility that I'm trying to relearn as I go. Uh, I currently work with Nobility, a nonprofit in the United States, who uh, aims to make the web accessible for, for all. As Alex was saying, um, we have, now first I'm gonna jump, there's a two-sheet two handout which is basically a collection of all the links that I'm gonna use in the presentation. Now also a very quick uh, cheat sheet for you to make sure that when you're going through accessibility, you, you've checked different items. So you can grab that, it's a PDF. You don't need it for the uh, for the workshop, but if you want it, you can work from it. Also, we're having extra time for us, that, so you don't need to come after uh, 320 if you don't want to, but if you want to play a little bit more and do more hands-on stuff, I'm going to be there to guide you and, and talk about different issues. So it's going to be in the room next door in 401. Um, so hope you be able to stick around. I have to say we don't have time to cover everything there is to know on accessibility testing because there's a whole lot, but this is gonna give you a um, really good introduction and a good feel for things. And if you're able to check your websites, your app for what we're gonna talk about today, you're gonna be in really good shape. So it's gonna be useful. Uh, so it's to get you started. And it's going to help you develop a workflow to really find the major issues that you have. Before I go on, let me ask if there's anyone that's going to need me to describe the slides I'm using in the presentation. No hands, no waves. So, okay. We're going to go on like this. So, I'm going to do, welcome. I'm going to do a quick accessibility overview. Before I go there, show of hands who feels they are really comfortable with website accessibility. Okay. Show of hands for people that have never even looked at what accessibility means. A few hands raised. Okay. So we're having basically a whole bunch of newbies that are interested in the topic and that's fantastic. This session, the accessibility overview, is really, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly because we really want to get into the nitty gritty of how to do accessibility testing, but it's good background information. So, what is accessibility? It's basically um, defined in many different ways, but I like to think about it as the inclusive practice of making websites usable by everyone regardless of ability or disability. Now, when we think accessibility in general, we're thinking about people with disabilities, but it really benefits everyone, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. You may come across seven different um, definitions, and that's fine, but it's all gonna be pretty much the same kind of approach, the idea of making things work for people. We have, on average, 20% of people with disabilities throughout the Western world. Now, these numbers vary. Uh, some, some census that I will tell you is 15%. Some census that I will tell you is 22%. It changes a little bit uh, based on where you're at, but also based on how the questions are asked and how the data is collated. But 20% um, is, is a good thing. That means that we're what? We're under uh, all cat census, et cetera. We're 23 people in the room 
So we have at least one person with a disability in the room, me. I know of at least another one, so we have at least two people with disabilities in the room. And that's not counting the other people with disabilities that aren't so visible. So we're start thinking about having an impact on, on everybody around us when we're building for accessibility. One of the issues that we encounter as um, website developers, website owners, business owners, is that we don't have any metrics about who comes to our website with disability. It's one of the things they tell me, you know, Nick, why should I make my website accessible? There's nobody that comes to my website that's got a disability, you know. I don't have anyone blind coming to my web website. And I'm saying, how would you know? There's no way to know because we don't use the web with a big red flag saying, hey, I use a screen reader or I don't use a mouse. We, we have metrics for browsers and operating system and how many minutes or seconds somebody stays on the site, but we don't know who comes with a disability to the site. So we have to refer back to this idea that we have at least one in five visitors that has a, visibility, a disability that can be impacted by, um, by barriers we caused in our, in our coding. And if I'm going too, slow, too fast, slow me down, wave at me, ask questions. So we have people with vision impairment, obviously. Um, it's one of the things we hear the most about is uh, people who are blind or screen reader users. We have also people that have low vision. We also have people that are colorblind. How many men on average have some kind of color blindness? Anybody can throw a number? Yeah, 8% of men have color blindness. Now, if you're doing, oh, I don't know, say a monitoring system and you say everything's good, it's going to be a green dot and uh, there's a problem, it's a red dot and you have those two dots side by side and there's no other way than colors to identify this, well, your sysadmin that's colorblind is going to have to do a lot of guesswork. Food for thoughts. Um, we're talking about hearing impairments. We have obviously people who are deaf, but we have people who are hard of hearing and there's different impacts there. Obviously, the, the primary impact is uh, videos or audios that don't have transcripts or captions. We have uh, people with physical or motor impairments. So it can be someone who's paralyzed from the neck down, doesn't use a mouse. It can be someone with cerebral palsy that has a lot of shaking. And when they use the mouse, they can't have fine motor control. We can have a whole range of different disabilities that are physical. And finally, we have cognitive or neurological. So we have people with learning impairments, whether it's uh, dyslexia, people are having a hard time reading your text. Uh, it can be someone with a uh, traumatic brain injury, so they have problem concentrating, or they're easily distracted if they have ADHD, and suddenly you have your widgets and your slides that are all calling for attention. So these can really have a lot of impact on um, on the way people use your websites, your apps. I'm going to talk mostly about websites, but it applies to apps as well. Accessibility is good for everyone. Simple as that. Um, I mentioned someone that was shaking, that has cerebral palsy and, and find movements is difficult, but it also is really um, beneficial for you if you have big fingers and you have a small checkbox and you're trying to tap something on your phone, especially if you're on the bus, you know, the bus moves and suddenly it becomes difficult. So it's, it's beneficial that way. Uh, we're talking about someone that has dyslexia. Uh, it's really difficult for them to read complex text, but it's also good for non-native English speakers that come to your website. The other advantage of that, if you use plain language, is that um, Google Translate or other machine translation are going to have a much easier time translating your site into something that actually resembles what you meant. Um, have you ever tried, just going on a tangent, pasting a blog post you wrote into Google Translate, say translate it into Japanese, and then copy-paste the Japanese result and translate it back into English. Anyone has tried that? A couple of shakes of the head. Yeah, it can make for really hilarious results. So the simpler 
the plainer your text is, the easier it's going to be to translate accurately. And I'm not talking about dumbing down the language, but you know, we're talking simple sentences that don't go on for three paragraphs. Um, we have people with low vision. They will have difficulty reading text gray on gray. It's, it's one of my pet peeves. Uh, but it's also good for those of us that try to read stuff on a website, on a, on a phone in bright sunlight, for example. So those are just a few examples of how improving accessibility for people with disability will, will really open the door and make your site more usable for everyone. When we talk about accessibility, I will be referring to WCAG or WCAG, which stands for the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It is the standards that is being used across the world. Uh, but it's not the be all and end all of accessibility. It's important for you to understand what it is, to be able to refer to it, because there's tons of great information there. But we're talking about something that is Written by the W3C, it's a standard, it's a bit complex. So we're talking about three levels. We have level A, level AA, and level AAA. So level A is the most basic level of accessibility. AA is generally the level at which government organization and laws refer to level AA as something what you have to comply to. Those three levels apply to four principles themselves broken into 12 guidelines, themselves broken into 61 success criterias, and a metric shit ton of technique that apply to that. So if you were to print out all of VoiCAG, you would kill probably about three forests. Um, there's a lot, and I don't expect anybody to go home and start studying and learning this by heart, because that's not what you want. It's not useful. To complicate things a little bit, we have WCAG 2.1 that is coming out soon when it's adding, I think it's 15 or 16 new success criteria to, to target some things that had been missing in 2.0, uh, especially around cognitive impairments. So it's, it's really growing complex. If you remember nothing else about WCAG, remember the four principle, and it stands for poor. Anybody can hazard a guess as what poor stands? Hint, it's on my t-shirt. Right? We're talking about P for perceivable. So you're able to perceive the information either directly through your senses or through the browser or through assistive technology. We're talking about operable. So you have to be able to interact with the uh, controls of, with the elements, with any elements of the page. We're talking about understandable. So you have to not be able only to perceive the information, but understand what it means, because you can throw a whole bunch of jargon out there. And unless you're talking to somebody else that works in the same field, they may not be able to understand it. And finally, we're talking about robust. So content can be accessed by old and new technologies all the new user agents and assistive technology. Does that make sense? You're right. Now, compliance with WCAG does not mean that you're going to have necessarily an accessible website. It's going to get you a long way. But I have seen some developers manage the feat of having a website that was 100% compliant with WCAG and totally not usable by people with disabilities. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. For example, taking an example from real life accessibility, this is a curb cut in uh, Chicago that I came across. It is 100% compliant with the building regulations. The steepness of the uh, curb cut is not too steep. There's a uh, dotted uh, band, so someone with a cane will be able to know we're reaching the street. There's a uh, nice elevated uh, bands on the side so your wheels can't fall off. But of course, uh, it's going nowhere. There's a telephone pole. So you, you haven't done that thinking one step forward. So hopefully, we're, we're going to think about that as we go through. Right, so 
let's get into the nitty-gritty of things. Um, before I get into it, was there any question or concerns or comments about what I covered in the first overview? Nothing. All right. Feel free to fire things at me. Questions, ideally, not tomatoes. Um, we're going to talk today about a little bit about automated testing, a whole lot about manual testing, and a little bit about user testing. Those are really the three areas that are important for, um, for accessibility testing. Automated testing is good because it's quick. Um, not all errors need a, uh, a human eye to, to look at it. Uh, automated testing can review hundreds of pages at the same time, and it's really good to get a, a pulse of how your site is doing, especially if you're having hundreds of pages on it. On the other hand, it's incomplete. Um, there was a test done by a accessibility groups at the BBC last year, and they created what they call the most inaccessible page in the world. So they tried to cram as many accessibility errors. I think they had 150 or something on their page. And the best automated accessibility testing tool found about 38% of all the errors. So we're talking about really less than half of the, uh, the errors are able able to be found. Um, we have issues with alternate text. An automated test can tell you, yes, there's an alt attribute, but it can't tell you whether the alt attribute has correct text or if it should be a null attribute or what. Um, it's looking at forms, but it can't really judge what's there, what's not. Uh, it really can't do a great analysis on colors. Uh, scripting, dynamic content, interaction with screen readers. There's a whole thing, kind of thing that can't be um, done with, um, with automated testing. Uh, you don't have to go to that site, but that's the most inaccessible website in the world. Uh, as I said, I have the links in the, in the handout. You can go check it out later. It's, it's quite entertaining if you want to go through and, and try your hand at finding what's wrong with these things. When we're talking about manual testing, and this is what we're going to do, we're going to exercise our human judgment as to what is good and what is not. It is slower. It can take sometimes a whole day analyzing a page, just doing one page. Uh, and it also depends on your level of experience with testing. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more feedback you have from other people, the easier it's going to be to, to build that. Uh, skill set. Talking about user testing, um, who does user testing other than accessibility here? Do you run your sites through user testing? Few people, yeah. Would you agree that nine times out of ten, your user finds something on your site that you had never considered before? Yeah, same thing. I've tested pages that I thought were really good, and I throw it to user testing, and they just find things I hadn't found. So if you can at all allow, uh, afford it, do one or two or three rounds of user testing as you're going through your development process. I should say, accessibility is not something you tag on at the end. It's something that should be planned from, from the start of a project. Uh, a good example, if, if you build a house, and you put in a narrow door and two steps, and then suddenly you say, hey, I have a friend, Nick, in a wheelchair. I want him to come visit me. Let me fix that. Suddenly it's going to cost you a normal leg to actually take the door out, make a bigger hole in the wall, put a new door in, put a ramp in. It's going to be really expensive. But if you had built it accessible from the get-go, you're looking at maybe 1%, 2% difference in cost. So it's really, it really pays to, to do it from the start of your project. OK, automated testing tools. Um, I'm going to talk about two tools right now. The first one is Tenon.io. Uh, I'm talking about Tenon because it is the clear winner of automated accessibility testing in, uh, in studies. They were the one that found 38% of all errors. So I'm going to switch to, to the web. Uh, let's see. 
going to um, <clears throat> so tenant.io is good it's got two things the first thing is you can do it one page at a time and it's free but you can also uh, buy into their commercial service and they offer really great APIs and you can run everything you want on that so let's try oh I don't know um, linux.conf.au and see what happens here and you analyze the page okay so let's try another one um, who wants to give me a website Anybody? Which one? Sol one. Okay, so there's a problem with tenon. I will have to let the guys know. So, when you do a demo, live demo, and it falls on its face, it's pretty <laughs> typical. Um, it, notwithstanding this this error, I don't know what's going on, but it's really a great tool to uh, to use. Um, the other tool I wanted to talk about is the um, the Wave toolbar. So let's do this. Oops. So one dot com dot au. Now the Wave toolbar is something that's quite effective to uh, get an idea of what's going on as well. It's one page at a time. Uh, it's a toolbar you can install. There's a link in the handout, so we have Wave here. And what it does, it's, it looks at an analysis of all the elements on the page. So we can see at a glance, the summary tells us there's 30 errors, there's 16 alerts, 29 features, and all kinds of other things. We also have 76 contrast errors. So if we look at the flag down here, then it starts telling you what the issues are. So we have a whole bunch of missing alternative text, and the icon in the sidebar is the same as the icon, for example, start a remote session up here. We have a linked image that's missing alternative text. So that's really a problem, because someone who relies on screen reader their machine is going to announce, hey, there's a link here, but because the link is actually an image and there's no alternative text, they will have no way to know where the link goes. Uh, we have form labels without, uh, form inputs without labels. We have a button that's empty, so it's probably a missing alternative text. We have empty links, and that's probably referring to the linked image. We have several broken area references. So it gives you an idea. I'm not going to keep hammering on Sol 1, but you guys know that you have some homework to do in the next, uh, next wee while. So let's get rid of Wave and go back to Keynote. Um, so we have the Wave toolbar. I just reviewed that. There's Opquest. That is a French thing. Excuse me. <coughs> it's another set of automated tool that will give you results in different ways that is something you may want to add to your toolbox because it's quite useful to have different perspective and there's also totally uh, which helps you visualize errors on a, on a site so it's pretty solid information now automated testing as I said is really powerful to get a pulse of what things are happening on a site but it's not something you should rely on 100%. So we had a quick overview. Uh, I do apologize on behalf of Carl Grove, the maker of Tenon, that it didn't work. I will tell him it didn't work, and we'll get it fixed. So manual testing tools. Who here can tell me what the most important accessibility testing tool is? What's that? Yes, Turning off images is a good suggestion. Anybody else? Screen reader. 
Screen reader, okay. What else? It's something that you, every single one of you interacts with every single day, yes. Keyboard, that's exactly right. So we're talking about the keyboard. That is the piece of assistive technology that is the most important for your testing. Um, because you have it, everybody has it, and it's going to give you a good feel for what happens. We'll talk a little bit more about keyboards in a minute. We have the color contrast analyzers. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there. I personally use the WebAIM contrast analyzer. Who has used co color contrast analyzers before? One hand, okay, two. Right, so we have a few people. I'll, I'll go back to the web and let's look at what we're talking about when we're analyzing color contrast. Okay, so the color contrast analyzer from WebAIM is really good because you give it a hex value for the foreground color and a hex value for the background color and then it will tell you the contrast ratio. The contrast ratio should be, when you're looking at regular text, it should be a minimum of 4.5 to 1. If you're looking at large text, it should be a minimum of 3 to 1. Large text generally is 18 points or bigger. Now, has everybody here thought, as I asked in the homework, about a website you want to test for accessibility. We all have a website. Go to your website. Go to WebM Color Contrast Analyzer. And when you're ready, let me know, and I'll show you how you decide the colors. Everybody ready? Yeah, nah, yeah. Right, I'm gonna pick on Linux Conf again. They told me it was all right, so I'm gonna do that. So when I look at this website, my experience tell me there's several areas of contrast issues. Can you hazard a guess at which areas of this screen might be problematic from a contrast perspective. The logo, the logo yeah. The yeah. The yeah. What else? The Pardon me? The the yeah. The uh, gray writing on the orange. The what else? Yeah, the white on gray, all right. So these are easy to spot. Sometimes it's not so easy, but let's, let's just do a, get the color of, say, the uh, blue of the logo and go back to where is color. So if we paste that in here, it's against white, and we have a contrast ratio of 2.04 to 1. So even for large text, if we go back to the Linux Conf, even for large text, the header here, which is the same color as the logo, we're way below the contrast ratio that's acceptable. And if you look at this, it tells you uh, it fails at both AA or AAA, both with normal text and large text. So if you run these kind of as, uh, analysis on your sites, you will be able to fairly quickly get a feel for that. Now, one of the things that I get often told by companies is, but these colors are our corporate colors. We can't change them. And I say, well, you have a choice. Either you change them, and then your site becomes more usable for a lot of people, or you don't change them, and then you open yourself up for a lawsuit. Now, 
I know Australia is not quite as lawsuit prone as the United States. However, you guys were the first country in the world in 2000 to have the biggest lawsuit for accessibility on the web uh, with the, uh, the Olympics. So it's not out of realm of possibilities that you have some legal liability there. Any questions or comments on color contrast? Are you finding horrible stuff on your websites? No, if you chuckle, I guess that means yes. Right, so let's go back to here. Zoom page. Um, I won't do a demonstration of it here, but Zoom page is a great emulator. It works in Firefox. Uh, it emulates text resizing rather than browser resizing. Anybody knows the difference between text versus browser zoom? Don't chuckle. Yeah, you know, you know. Anybody knows the difference? No? All right. Browser zoom will enlarge everything on the screen. Text resizing will also enlarge most things on the screen, but it won't scale images the same way. But the most important aspect is that people with low vision that need large text normally have changed the size of their fonts at operating systems level. Since you don't want to do that every day, working every day, we use a, uh, an emulator, which is Zoom page. And I'll get back on how to use it later. But if you have installed it, these are the settings that will allow you to go directly to 200% resize, which is what's called for by the, uh, the guidelines. Um. Code inspection, I am making the wild assumption that everybody here has some preferred code inspecting tool. I like the web dev tool toolbar, but it doesn't matter what you use, we're going to refer to it. OK, screen readers. Who has tested things with screen readers? A couple hands, hand and a half, OK. This is great. It's a lot of fun. However, screen readers is really complex software. I've been using screen readers since 1996, and I am nowhere near as fluent as somebody who does use it. Uh, experience is mission critical. Uh, it will give you a good indication of what's going on, but you can come across false positives where, where you find something that tells you, hey, there's a problem here. And when, in fact, there isn't because somebody who uses a screen reader day in, day out will be able to go around it and, and jump through hoops and make the thing works. There's four major screen readers at the moment. We're talking about JAWS, which is on Windows, which is the uh, granddaddy of all screen readers. They were the first one, and they're still pushed by a lot of uh, rehab agencies on people with vision impairments. It also happens to cost about 1,200 US dollars. There is uh, a trial mode of it, so you can use it 40 minutes at a time. Uh, I must tell you that their um, user policy expressly forbid you from using the demo mode for accessibility testing. So I'm just saying that, you know, it's, it's out there. Um, NVDA is also on Windows. It's uh, open source. It's a great product. I really recommend anybody who uses uh, Windows, give it a go, download it, install it, play with it. If you're on Mac, you have VoiceOver, which is built into your, uh, to your device. Uh, VoiceOver is also on your phone. It's great. We won't talk about VoiceOver on the phone, but if you want to grab me after the session, I can show you how to do really cool things, like close your eyes and take a selfie with your phone with just VoiceOver going. And if you're on Linux, there's Orca. Now, I have to apologize. I cannot help you with Orca. I know it exists. I've never tried it. I know it's great, but that's about the extent of, of my experience with it. Screen readers work really well in certain combinations. So JAWS works well with IE, works mostly well with Edge, but you'll have sometimes some weird results. NVDA works best with Firefox. And VoiceOver works best with Safari. Um, these combinations of browser will give you the most 
accurate result in your in your testing when you're looking because if you use uh, voiceover with Safari with Firefox you may get totally different results so that's one thing to keep in mind the, the combination of screen reader browser I'm not gonna go too much in depth into how to use the screen readers but we'll if you're sticking around for the second part if you have time we can look at it a little bit more. WebAIM, again, has a great guide on how to use uh, NVDA and VoiceOver and JAWS for, f to test for accessibility. Uh, what you need to know is screen readers have a series of commands, and those are usually issued by using a modifier key. So with NVDA, it's the insert key. If you're on a laptop that doesn't have an insert key, then it's the, uh, you can modify that for caps locks. There's different thing, and then you use the modifier key and whichever other key combination to read the text. For example, insert arrow down will read the entire page from, where, from the point you're at. Same thing with voiceover, and we'll look at voiceover a little bit more in, lo in a little bit. The um, modifier key for voiceover is control option, and that's referred to as VO when you're looking at keyboard shortcuts. So I'm going to switch back and do a little bit of a quick demo for a second. But first, let's go to system preference, uh, accessibility, voiceover, voiceover agility, speech. OK, so. Where is my demo? Here we go. <coughs> so we're going to start voiceover. It's command F5. Voiceover on Safari. Screen reader demonstration text. Part of the whole window. Screen reader demonstration text. Part of the whole has keyboard focus. You are currently on my content. Two hundred layer. Press control. Option shift down arrow. So nobody understood anything that was said. I bet I certainly didn't. But let's say I'm telling it to read the whole thing, just as an example. Screen reader demonstration text. Part of the whole. Part of the whole. Link. Put out. Link. Archives. Link. Contact. Link. My name is Melissa. Now. I speak. Link. Train. Link. And consult. Link. About inclusion. Accessibility. Accessibility. Screen reader demonstration text. Attack. Two things. It was the best times. It was the worst times. It was the usual wisdom. 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 That's the speed, my friend Sina Baram, who's blind, who has been using a screen reader for over 30 years. That's the speed at which he gets his machine to read. I didn't understand a single thing, but I was able to follow where the the where the text was. Um, Let's kill voiceover and go back to our utility and put it at something that's a little bit more. Um, Rate 45, the best way to predict the. Yeah, that's going to work. So, voiceover. When you're using a screen reader, when you're a user of a screen reader, um, it typically is because you have no vision. It could be because you have dyslexia and you find reading really hard. So, some of these people that have particular problem with reading with dyslexia will use a screen reader to be able to follow along. When sighted users look at a screen, we can kind of take a glance. We see part of a whole, we see the header, we see there's a subheader, so we have a feel for what the page is. And the best way for a screen reader user to do that is to access uh, landmarks or headings or links. So you can do that. Um, Talking about it for voiceover, but there's the equivalent functions in NVDA and in JAWS and in ORCA. So we can bring up a list headings of menu. headings. So we can see there's heading one is a part of whole, heading two is screen reader demonstration text, heading three is tale of two city. So you could move to um, any of these headers just using the arrows and it would bring you directly there. You can also look at Form controls menu. what forms are on the uh, sites. So right now there's only a search form. No items in web spots. We have menu. no web spots. Landmarks menu. We have a website uh, landmark which is site. No items in articles menu. We have menu. no article. We have no spots. Links menu. And we have all the links. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about links later. But who has seen a read more or a click here link anywhere? Okay, everybody has pretty much. So what happens, do you think, when a blind user goes and uses a screen reader to get an idea of what links are on a page, and suddenly there's a list of about 5, 10, 15, click here, or read more? 
suddenly it makes no sense. That's why it's so important to craft good links that the link text actually makes sense in and of itself. So I'm gonna escape out of that. Consult link. And I'm going to, um, actually let's go back here. Links menu, headings menu. To the headings and to- Level two headings menu. Okay, so. Consult link. You so are currently let's a consult get it to link read it. about inclusion, accessibility, and disability. Screen reader demonstration text. A tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of so times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the, the season hell? of darkness. It was the but spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before rate. us. You we had nothing before kind us. Of we were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct. The other. So talking over the screen reader is not very user friendly, but. That gives you an idea for what the screen reader is actually going to do for a user. Um, hopefully, we'll have a chance to each of you play with it, and I'll be going around not to laugh at you, but to help you along. Um, Voice over off. So let's go back to where are we? OK, so um, exercises. Normally, I have a bunch of exercises at this time to let you play, but we'll skip right through that right now. And we'll talk about manual testing. <coughs> so keyboard. To navigate forwards and backwards, we use the tab key is going forwards, or shift tab to go backwards. If you want to activate a button, a link, another element, it's either the space bar or the enter key. So go to your website, and let's try to play for a couple minutes with tabbing forward, tabbing backwards. If you're on Mac, and using Safari, it's option shift or option, no, option tab or option shift tab. Otherwise, you're going to have weird results. What's the first impression that you get out of navigating your site with just the keyboard? Could you repeat that louder? <laughs> it's not a great experience. It's not a great experience. Yes, that's right. We'll play with it a little bit more uh, later. But um, my challenge to you is uh, spend a whole day, just one day, using just the keyboard. Don't use your mouse. Don't use your trackpad. And navigate the web. Actually, just forget that. Spend an hour navigating the web with just your keyboard. And um, you're going to get to really good sense as to why earlier I said the keyboard is a fantastic and important testing tool and why it's so important. Uh, challenge your friends and colleagues. Send them to nomouse.org and you can have fun. Once you've done this for yourself and you have a good sense, then you can explain to them why it's so important. Now, keyboards, um, on your site, when you load the page first, and the first tab stop, what, what is the first tab stop? Do you have a skip link? So a way to jump from the top of the page to the main content. Is there something like that? It's important. I'll, let's go to my site here. So we don't have a visible skip link here, but if we do uh, option tab, no, I'm not, oops, let's reload. OK, so if we do a, a tab, it's broken. How come? Let's try with JetBlue. Slow loading. OK, so JetBlue is an airline. By law, in 2017, they had to be fully accessible because they had the Amer Air Carriers, Americans, Air Carrier Accessibilities Act. Um, so they should have a tab stop. So see? You tab once, and suddenly it tells you skip to main content. That's very useful for someone who is a screen reader or a sighted keyboard only user, because then you don't have to tab through what, how many links to get to the main content. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and, and you get the idea. So suddenly, 
if you're stuck using only the keyboard, something like that becomes really important to be able to go straight to the main content. Maybe the first time you're on a site, you want to see all the options, all the navigation options, but maybe the fourth or fifth or sixth times you're going through, you don't want to have that happen again. So the skip to main content is really important. Questions or concerns on that? Okay, so let's go back to, um, so we're having skip links. We're looking at focus visible. Can you see the focus on your website as you're tabbing through? So let's escape out of here. Let's go to Firefox and Linux Conf. Now, it's not very good on Linux Conf and Firefox. So let's do a first tab stop. Uh, we have a little bit of an outline around the logo. Now the next tab stop is what? Can you tell me what the next tab stop is that I just got to? News. News, yes. So let's see what happens if I do the same thing in Safari uh, too. So tab, we have Linux Conf. Do you see how it's a little bit more visible in Safari? That's because the default browser outline is better defined in Safari and in Chrome and in Explorer and in Edge than Firefox for some strange reason. <clears throat> Some of you may be using Bootstrap, which has a built-in CSS reset. And if you're using an older version of Bootstrap, in the CSS reset, there's a declaration, outline none. And that means that you've just removed that default outline around your links. And unless you have specifically coded a styling for hover and focus, the links become impossible to see where you're at. Uh, Eric Meyer, who wrote the CSS reset, has since done a version two, and he's so very sorry he put that in because he says it was a big mistake. So let's keep going with Safari. So we have focus visible. The next thing we want to know is, can we get to all elements on the page? So when we looked on Firefox, we went from the logo to news. And then if we keep going, suddenly we're at good day. So what happened to the about menu, to the attend menu, to the program menu, to the sponsors menu? If you're a screen reader user or a keyboard, sighted keyboard only user, suddenly these have become non-existent. So going back to the principle, it has to be perceivable, right? Very first principle, these are not perceivable. We can't get to it. Uh, are there keyboard traps? So sometimes when you have a widget, typically calendar widget or, or something like that, you can tab forward and suddenly it stops. You can't, keep, you can't get out of that widget. Sometimes it happens with carousels. That's a big no-no. You have a nice big carousel at the top of your page and somebody's going through and suddenly they are not able to get past that. And can all your buttons, links, form element, can all that be reached and operated with the keyboard only? <laughs> images. OK, we're talking about images. Um, <coughs> sorry. All your images should have an alt attribute. No questions asked. All your images should have an alt attribute. Now we have to decide whether we're talking an, about an empty alt so an all alt that just has quote and quote, or alt that has some description. Here we're talking about decorative images versus informative images. So if you have an image that's just there for eye candy because you, you, know, you write a blog post, there's 800 words and it's really a wall of text, so you want to light it up a little bit, so you put an image. If it's decorative, really you want the screen readers to ignore it because you don't want to make the experience too heavy, too redundant. If it's not, uh, and, uh, if it's not decorative, if it actually provides additional information, then you want to add um, alter, uh, alternate text. There is a fantastic resource. Um, 
Where is it? Uh, let's try this. Uh, Alt decision tree. The W3C has done this fantastic resource. It's, it's really hand-holding you through all the elements that you can find. So it says, does the image contain text? No. Well, OK, you go to the next step. But if there is text, is the text also present as real text? And it tells you use an empty alt. And, and you can go through all these things to decide how you're going to handle the image. It's really, really good. But if we're looking back, uh, we have images. What images do we have? We have the first logo here. So if we do a inspect element, <coughs> it's not loading. It's going to be pretty much. OK, so we have the alt is Linux Conf AU 2018. That's a good alt text because it represent what the logo is. And because it's a link, uh, we want that text to tell you what it is. Now, if it was just a logo without a link, you may choose to actually put an, uh, an empty alt in it. Uh, it. That depends a little bit on the decision of the, uh, of the design team. Now, if we're looking at this logo here, What's the problem with this logo? There's no alt attribute at all. So what would be the solution there? What would you do? Empty hmm? alt. Empty alt? Why? Because it's, it's not a link, and it's just telling you the same thing you already know. That's right. So. Alex says we would use an empty alt because it's not a link and it doesn't bring anything new, any new information that you don't already know. So that's a good decision. So that, that gives you a little bit of an idea of the, the decision process. Now, if we were to use a screen reader and once it gets to that image, what it would say is it would announce image. And then you're in a situation where you don't know what the image is for. Is it informative? Is it decorative? What am I going to do with this information? Do I have to ask a sighted friends to tell me what, what's this here? So if you put an empty alt, the screen reader is going to be able to parse that information that it's, it's not important. Alt text is something that has been around for a long time, and it continues to be a problem. Um, there's a couple of people that were at my lightning talk on Monday. For those of you who weren't, here's a bit of interesting trivia. The image tag was um, put into HTML in 1992. The alt attribute was put into HTML in 1995, which means that for a three-year period, screen reader users had no way of accessing information about these images. How about you go on your website and try to spot an image and see if, if the alt is correct? What are you finding? Is it OK to use the title attribute on the anchor tag still? Aha, title attribute. Um, it's a very good question. I would not use the title attribute on anything except um, SVG icons. Okay. Uh, so the question is, can we still use the title attribute? And the answer is, there's really no point. Because uh, we use the title attribute, or we, we used to use it to give more information about an element, whether it's a link or an image or something like that. And some people thought, well, if I use the title attribute on my image, it's a way to provide more information about the image. Except that uh, 
browsers handle the title attribute differently from uh, browser to browser, operating system to operating system, and screen reader users sometimes plain ignore it. Or if there's a title attribute, we'll read both the title attribute and the alternative text, or we'll read only one and not the other, and it creates a real mess, and you really just should ignore the title attribute. Just remove it. It's, it's easier. You're going to save a few bytes of your pages, and uh, it's going to be easier for people. Forms. There is one major thing that we want to do for forms is make sure that every input element has a label. <clears throat> Can anyone hazard a guess as to why we want to do that? Screen readers, yes. More specifically, what happens to screen readers if there's no label to the form element? Yeah, it's very silent. It gets to the form element, and it's going to announce uh, form element input text. And then you don't know what the input is for. So it's very important to have a label there. Typically, you want the label to be visible for people. In some cases, you may want to hide it from sighted people because it just will break with your layout. But you want to make sure it's available for a screen reader's uh, user. To do that, you use CSS, uh, but don't use display none, because screen, reader user, uh, screen readers actually parse display none and will make it non-accessible to, um, to screen readers. So if we go back to, um, where was it? Sol1, we had a few problems. I'm, I'm picking on you, but I'm not really picking on you. Um, so where's a form here? That's a button. Wasn't there a form on this? Contact. OK, contact, let's see. So we have form here. So if we look at this inspect element, we're going to see that um, we have a label. Where's the label? We have no label. So what happens here? Uh, well, someone will come in, and they will hear form input text, and they won't know what it is. Um, quick tip, you're using WordPress contact form. Do yourself a favor. Download Joe Dawson WP, uh, contact, WP7 contact form, whatever, accessible. It's an add-on to the uh, contact form plugin, and it will fix all these issues with uh, contact form 7. <clears throat> this is a good one. Thank you. I'm not picking on you. Um, I'm going to highlight. I'm jumping a little bit all over the place, but this is cool because we have it here. We have the area required equals true, right? Everybody sees that. So that tells uh, an assistive technology that that form field is required, which is important. However, when we look at this, uh, we have no way to know that this field is required other than a black asterisk. So a sighted user that doesn't have access to a screen reader will not have any other way than this asterisk to know that the form field is required. It might be tricky for someone who's not used to uh, entering contact information or using forms to know that this actually means it's required. Now, for Sol1, it's unlikely that my 97-year-old grandmother might go to that site and use it to try to get in touch. But when she was trying to contact her uh, newspaper uh, to say, hey, I'm not getting my subscription, what's going on, she did not know what was going on because it was a little asterisk that meant it was required. And she got really frustrated to the point that she called me from Belgium to help her figure out how to fill the form. And I lived in Canada. And it was only 10 PM at night for her. It was middle of the night for me. It didn't work very well. So um, 
I digressed a little bit into uh, the required. So the way to um, the way to associate forms is if we look at this form and we look at it, inspect element. We have a label here. See, I have the class hidden, which means that I have it, uh, if we look on the right, absolutely positioned and clipped. That means that you can't see it visually, but it's there for screen reader users. And the form is associated with the for attribute. So that programmatically ties the label to the input field. Does that make sense? That is a major snafu from my part, and I should remove it. So thank you for pointing that out. See, even accessibility expert miss a few things. So thank you. I will. Yes, the, the comment was that um, I have actually two definitions on my hidden class. One is a display none that comes in for pure min CSS. And I think what happened there is I, um, I upgraded my system to go uh, secure HTTPS two weeks ago, and I had a new version of Pure Min, and that's probably where I missed it. But I'm going to have to fix that. So going back here, forms, error messages is one of the big problems. We often see inline validation. So you start typing, and it tells you there's an error until you finish typing. This is typically not accessible to screen readers. Or if it is accessible, every time they type a new letter, there's the error message that flashes at them and say, error, there's, uh, this form is not correct. Then they type another letter, error, this form is not correct. So either they don't see it at all, or they're being bombarded with, uh, with messages. So you have to be careful. If you do um, validation once the form has been completed, typically you will um, see that the uh, input field turns with a red border or red text in the label. And also, that might be tricky to uh, determine with a screen reader user. So the best way to fix that is you have a list of errors at the top of the form. So for example, first name uh, is required. Make sure you put it in. And once the form reloads with these error messages, you put focus directly on the error message buckets. So the screen reader user will see that error or hear that error announced. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about area described by right now. I might do that in the second part, because we're um, pressed for times for everything. Um, forms, timeout. Typically, you see it uh, when you're going to book a ticket, when you're banking, when you're trying to buy an airline ticket. Uh, these kind of things, it's a time sensitive thing. And you may have two minutes or three minutes to complete a form. You want to let the user know that they're running out of time. And for those sites that do it, they will often put in a div at the top of the screen that says you have one more minute. Do you want to complete and continue or abort? But unless you notify the screen reader that this is happening, they have no way to reach that content. <clears throat> The easiest way to fix that is you throw in an area live region uh, in the, the div. So um, I'm throwing information area live. Remember that area live will actually grab the screen reader workflow and say, hey, there's a, something that changed on the page, and you want to pay attention to that. Do you want to have a look at the forms on your sites now? Have a look or carry on and look at it later? No reaction. Have a look. I'll stop talking for a second.
What are you finding? Are all your forms inputs have labels? I see a couple nods yes. I see a couple shakes head no. It's, it's a pretty easy thing to, to fix. Just needs to happen. <clears throat> so document structure. Remember when I did the demo for the screen reader? We looked at uh, an easy way to navigate a page through seeing what's, what's, uh, what headings are on the page. This is where it's important to have um, things in a hierarchical order. So you have heading one, heading two, heading three. You're not skipping headings and you're not missing headings. So if we go back to, say, um, close this, Linux Conf, close this. Let's look at the heading structure here. Where's my web developer? Um, uh, it's not working. Well, I'm missing part of my screen that I normally don't miss. Uh, okay. I'm going to throw the wave toolbar because it should be able to tell us uh, errors. So there's no, ah yeah, here we go. We have one level H1, we have four level H2s, we have two H3s, and we have two H4s. So if we look at it where they are, we have the welcome to Linux Conf is heading one, conference is underway is heading two, conference date is heading two, heading three is the dates, heading two is reception. Do you think this is a good heading structure? Is it hierarchical? Is it skipping things? Could it be improved? So the things that, to me, are not heading, so like the conference and the way is like a, a headline. It's, it's, not, it's not part of the structure of the document. Right, so the comment here is that some things that are currently marked as headings are not really headings. Uh, for example, the conference is underway. It's more information than, uh, than headings. So here, a heading was used to style text whereas it has no semantic meaning, and you should use headings in a way that actually provides semantic information. Uh, the conference date is a good heading, uh, heading two, but the conference is underway is probably should not be marked up as a heading because it is just information. Any other comments about this heading structure? The conference date as a H3 is a similar issue, is yes. Um, this one is interesting because it could be argued that it is an important bit of information that you want a screen reader to be able to display at a glance when you're looking at the rotor. So some people will say, no, that's a fail. It really should not be a heading. Some people will say, well, maybe it shouldn't be technically a heading, but it has important semantic information in the context of the page. So you have to make that, that uh, judgment call. Yeah, I mean, when I'm from this following on, I thought it's really like another element of that list. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So the other comment is the uh, the text of the heading is very long. We have the dates, the month, where it is, uh, the city, and so on and so forth. So it becomes very uh, very cumbersome. <coughs> Anything else? Going once, going twice. I'm happy you're not saying anything else because I think other than that is pretty solid. So let's look at uh, empty headings. One of the things that we see often is when we have dynamic content, we're going to throw in a heading that's hidden uh, from site, but it's just an empty H2. There's no text in it, but it's going to get 
uh, grabbed in uh, by assistive technology and it's going to be confusing because we don't know why there's a heading there since there's no text. Language. There's two things. We're talking about um, is the language of the page declared in the head, the top. So typically we're normally working with pages in English. So we want to make sure that we declare the, the in the HTML that um, it's English. So for example, uh, where am I? So let's go to my page. Um, not here, there. So if we look at inspect elements, here HTML has been declared as English Canadian. It could be English Aussie, it could be straight English. That's very important because it's going to tell the assistive technology which language to use to parse the page. If you're having a part of the page that is in a different language, so say for example you're using an expression déjà vu, it's French, uh, you want the screen reader to be able to pronounce it properly, so you would declare the language for that span or that paragraph or that div to be a different language. So the screen reader is going to be able to parse the change in language. Otherwise, it makes from some really interesting, um, <coughs> interesting bits. I'll show you what it can sound like. Uh, say I'm going to my main page. I'm going to the French side. And let's try it with screen reader. What happens when a screen reader doesn't read voiceover on Safari. Axe oil. Doesn't read a uh, language properly. It sounds funny. Axe oil. Part of a whole. Passe au contenu principal. Link. Select the language. English. Link. Link. My name is Nicholas Steenhout. Je présente. Link. Form. So it's probably not as effective if you're not a French speaker, but it's reading the language as if it was English, and it sounds really wrong. So it will, um, it will make a big difference for a screen reader uh, user to be able to tell the assistive technology that you've switched language. Uh, it's good if you have Japanese pages, if you have Spanish language pages, or, or elements like that. If you're in New Zealand, if you have Maori, uh, screen readers are actually very good at parsing Maori if the Maori language has been defined. Uh, let's kill. Voice over off. Uh, what else? Text resize. So we spoke a little bit about text resize er earlier. Um, I'm going to go pick on Linux Conf again. Uh, let's kill Wave. <coughs> What's that? So I, I am on my operating system. I generally have large, medium, or large text. Yeah. Um, and as soon as I went into like trying to go into Linux Conf. Yeah. On my so the comment here is that her system is set up for large font, and the moment she went into the Linux Conf page, it broke the layout. So let's use the um, not as bad as some, not as bad as some, but there's um, things. So let's look here. If you do zoom page, and we're going to 200 percent. So we have the menu becomes a little bit difficult to read. It's it's still kind of usable, but it's it's problematic. Um, we have the drop downs are kind of OK. But yeah, we're we're not all that happy now. Uh, if we scroll down, what happens here? This looks OK. The map is not particularly good. The rest is doing OK sponsors. Now let's do it like my friend Matt who um, goes to 400 percent. I don't have it set up. 300. Uh, 300 percent the menu becomes illegible. Uh, the rest is doing pretty good. It's all right. You want me to pick on Sol 1 again? See how that happens? All right. No? OK, so, so let's do it at 200%. Oops, suddenly it becomes a little bit. 
see we have a line height issue. Probably the line height was defined as a uh, fixed unit instead of a uh, dynamic unit. Uh, so that's a problem with readability. We have the form is all right. The capture suddenly becomes a little problematic. So again, it's mostly usable, but it can be a problem. Uh, if I go to JetBlue, they should be doing good because I worked with them long enough to make sure it worked. But let's see what happens on JetBlue. So we have one overlap here, the problem. Other than that, a few line height issues in the true blue. We have things that moved around. See, I haven't worked with them for 18 months, and suddenly things went belly up. Um, so we, we have a few issues, but it's mostly readable. Um, one typical thing is text get cut off in search boxes, so placeholder text disappears because we have fixed heights. So this gives you an idea of, of what can happen if you're testing for large size, you want to be able to read the information. Mostly, yeah, mostly the issue it has to do with um, most people that need large text set it directly into the operating system changes because they need it everywhere, whether it's email or Word documents or, or anything else. Um, Browser Zoom also um, sometimes gives strange results with, uh, with images and the relationship between, between elements on a page. But that, that primarily is because they don't use a plugin. They don't use, they don't increase text size on a page. They use it at uh, operating system level. And you can, can you do both as well? Um, yeah, like so the mine, the mine is up. I couldn't read my menus and things like that if that was being the font size, right? So I have to increase that at an operating system level. And then inside the sort of browser for me, it really depends on the website. Because if the contrast or things like that aren't set up right, then I will have to, or if the font they've used is really high, I'll have to increase it. But then I'll be in the yeah. browser. So it just depends uh, so on the... Th this is a great comment. Uh, you can use belt and braces. So uh, she uses both the operating system text font increase, but she also uses browser zoom sometimes on some websites depending on contrast, depending on how the site was coded. So you can use different tools to reach the point where you actually uh, are able to interact with the page. So the contact, contact, uh, comment here is if it becomes too problematic, then we can switch to a screen reader. So. Depending on the barrier on the site, you will use different tools and techniques. Um, Windows high contrast, all right. So for a lot of people with low vision, uh, the only thing they need is you looking at a site in a high contrast. And the best high contrast function is using Windows. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch to Windows and see what happens. Uh, where is this? I want to sleep. Why did you go to sleep, Windows? Okay, so we have um, we have the LCA website, and I'm going to switch to high contrast. For those of us on a Mac, you really need a virtual machine with Windows. For those of you on Windows, you have this natively. It's easy to use. Um, there's several shortcuts, but I'll show you without a shortcut. You just do high contrast, it comes up, high contrast settings. And hopefully it's going to wake up. What's going on? There we go. So we're going to choose a theme. I typically choose contrast one, which is the one that's used most. And we're going to say yes, apply. 
and go back to our website. So suddenly we have the Linux Conf in high contrast. So you'll see that text is one color, links are another color. It gets rid of a lot of things. But this is doing pretty good because most of the elements are quite visible. Um, the one thing I noted was the UTS logo was really hard to see in a high contrast. Basically, it's as if it didn't ex exist. The big problems you will encounter is if you use uh, SVG icons or if you use background images to deliver content, they will just not be there in a high contrast. So you want to be careful with that. Uh, the best way is really a foreground image that's not an SVG from that perspective. There's ways around it. If you, uh, if you do rely on SVG icon, I can talk a little bit more about it later. Um, but that's something you really should do is try your site in, uh, in high contrast mode. We have what? We have 20 minutes, is that right? So color contrast, we actually spoke about it earlier, so we won't have to spend too much time on that. Tables. Who here still uses tables for layout? One. I'll get to that. Very good point. Have you ever seen an email? Yeah. Um, other than email, tables for layout should not be used. We should use tables for tabular data because that's what tables are for. And we're not in the 90s anymore. Um, however, when you build a table, you want to make sure that it's easily parsable by screen readers because we're talking about two-dimensional information that's actually delivered in a linear fashion. And it becomes very difficult to, um, to navigate a table uh, if there's no information. So one thing you want to do is you want to make sure you have table headers, so TH. And the other thing that you want to do is you want to associate <coughs> the headers with the cells. And the easiest way to do that is to use the scope attribute on the table header. So you would be TH scope call. And that says it's the column. 95% of cases, you won't have a, uh, a table more complex than that, unless you're like Stefan and you have complex tables of data that are really nested in, and, and that becomes complex. But um, so let's look at what happens on Linux Conf. Uh, we have the schedule. Gee, this is slow. Wake up. Right. So let's wake um, voiceover and tell it to read Safari. the whole thing. So Linux.conf.au 2018 vertical line conference schedule. Linux.conf.au 2018. Link. About. Link. News. Link. Attend. Link. Program. Link. Sponsors. Link. Conference schedule. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Tab group. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Monday tab panel. Main conference. Monday, the 22nd of January 2018. Row 1. Column 1. Space. Column 2. Great Hall CDO 1.05.009. Column 3. Guthrie Theater CDO 6.03.28. Column 4. Collaborative Lecture Theater CD 11.00.405. Column 5. Medium Lecture Theater CD 11.00. So I'm going to stop it here. See how it announced the first cell as column 1, row 1? But there was nothing in it. So it doesn't know not to ignore it. So we, we don't quite know. So if we, um, if we move in row the two. table. LCA Games Miniconf. Games and FOSS. Uh, shut up. So let's go see what is going to be announced to um, the next one, conference opening. I'm just going down. Row five, opening. You are currently on a text. What happened here? I just went one or down. Normally, it should skip from one cell to another. Anyone can hazard a guess as to why the conference opening and the morning tea were skipped? 
That's right. It's column two. I was in column five, but because the column two is spanning all these rows, it just skipped right over it. So let's go back to scrolling down. In theory, it's the next one, if I just arrow down, is going to be open sourcing history, right? So row six span two rows. Open source in history using historians and games development link. Okay, so it told us what it is. How do you know in which room it's going to be held? You're going to have to go, hmm, let me go back to where? Row, row one, medium lecture theater, CD 11.00.401. Uh, okay, it's in medium you lecture theater. You are current a text element inside of us. So, you're row going two. back down. Row, row five, opening. Row six, span two rows. Open source and hit. So, you have to do a lot of navigation going back and forth between the cells, going back to the header row to identify what the data is associated with. This is not too bad, but when you're starting to look at um, numbers, say you have the age of, um, I don't know, the age of all your nephews and nieces, and you have Sarah is uh, two years old, and Jack is three years old, and then uh, Sarah had 100% on her exam, and Jack had 50% on his exam, and you start having numbers, then it becomes really difficult to navigate back and forth and knowing which cells mean what for for everything. So always associate table cells with the table header because it's going to be announcing when you get to cell, it says, uh, this is medium left theater, open source uh, history. Voice over off. Any question or comment on that? I went through that a little bit fast, but we have a few more things. Um, don't. Tables for layout, as I said, don't use tables for layout because it's really not the done thing. Uh, but if you must, for example, you're preparing emails, uh, uh, mass emails, and you need that for layout because email clients are really bad at uh, CSS for layout, add the role presentation to your table declaration and the screen reader is going to ignore all table elements. So it's not going to say once it's read here, table with five rows and then seven columns and it's just going to be able to uh, ignore that. Audio and video, uh, very quickly when you look at what you have there, do your videos have captions? Uh, do your, does your audio have transcripts? When you're looking at captions, Please, please, please do not rely on automated captions on YouTube. Uh, people call them automated craptions because uh, it makes some really interesting results sometimes. And you also want to make sure you can operate the controls of your video or uh, audio player with the keyboard. So typically, you can tab to all elements, the play, the scrubber, the, the volume, and use the arrows to adjust um, volume or uh, use the space bar to play and pause. So that is really quickly the testing workflow that you can use. Um, as I said, it's not covering everything. There's a lot more to be done. I'm happy to talk to you more about it in part two, which is more informal if you want to stick around. Uh, if you go home tonight or next week and you're looking at your site and you say, oh, geez, I don't know what to do with this, reach me, send me a tweet or send me an email and I'll be happy to help along with that. In the meantime, we have about 10 minutes. If you have burning questions or comments that you need to send and you can stick around, please feel free to um, tell me now. Yeah. So the, the question has to do with um, using libraries to build websites and then apps and all that. And are there any libraries that are better than other or, or um, the answer is it depends. 
Um, yes, there are a lot of accessible libraries, but it really depends on what system you're using. For example, if you're using Angular or React and you use it out of the box, it's going to be really sucky from an accessibility perspective. But there is accessible Angular. There is uh, there's different uh, plugins and, and accessibility uh, libraries for React as well. So depending on what you're using, uh, there will be more or less tools. Um, until about last year, I used to pick on Bootstrap all the time. Don't use Bootstrap because it's not accessible. And last year, they've done a lot of work and they've really improved uh, the level of, of Bootstrap in and of itself doesn't really matter if it's accessible, but do they provide the tools to help you make an accessible application? And yes, now you have these tools. So you have to do a little bit of your research and legwork. Unfortunately, I can't tell you, well, go to this site and it's going to have the li all the libraries you need because there's some libraries out there that are great. And typically, in the accessibility world, just like any other development world, uh, you have a great library and then somebody comes along and say, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way. I think I would have done it this way and maybe we should talk about this and suddenly you have two libraries and then the third person comes in and suddenly you have this proliferation of, of libraries that are sometimes very good for what you want to do but maybe not the best tool for your problem. So you have to do a little bit of hunting. It's complex. Um, Amy Marie was saying uh, for the video that um, you really have to look at the pattern libraries. Are they using native elements the way they're designed to be used? Uh, one typical thing is we're going to have a div and we're going to create it uh, as a button. So we're going to have div role equals button. So why not use a button instead? There is an element there that exists for that. So use HTML the way it was intended to be used. It's got a bunch of really neat features, including semantics. So do it that way. And I think that's about it. OK, so we're going to go to 300 for anyone who wants to stick around and uh, do a little bit more of the hands-on nitty-gritty stuff. Thank you for being here. Nick, thank you very much. I certainly learned a lot and appreciate this. Thank you. This. Um, thank you very much. the formal part. So I'm going to head there, but if you want to follow in a few minutes, take a break or whatnot, come in uh, when you want. I'll be there for a while. <laughs>